Hello, and welcome back to you. Radical Engagement here on Barn Block. And we are going through Kohei Sato's Metabolism Crisis and Elast Elasticity essay from his collection, uh, which is not just by him, he edited it, uh, Reexamining Engel's Legacy in the 21st Century from the Pelgrim and Macmillan Marx, Engels, and Marxism series. We are now on the section traditional view of orthodox marxism and the productive forces of capital let us continue and a reminder that so far uh sato has been evaluating lukash's understanding of elasticity and metabolism and crisis uh as a way to understand the distinction between marx and engels and between, quote, Western Marxism and Eastern Marxism, and which I think Sato is arguing that Lukács doesn't really belong in the category of Western Marxism, even though he inspired it, um, and that maybe he's too soft in Engels, although that's left to be seen. In the last episode, we also finally got that Sato uh, got his interpretation of whether or not crisis theory is valid from the history of capitalist development principles of Marxist political economy from Paul Sweezy in 1970, which is an anti-crisis theory, anti-breakdown theory text. Okay. And that excludes my digressions when I get art mad for Engels' uh, claim about labor distinguishing um, humans from apes by characteristics which are not unique to humans, aka communication, mutual labor, division of labor, all those things exist in apes too. Uh, maybe not as refinedly as they do in humans. Clearly they don't, um, but they do exist. Anyway, back to the text. Such theorizations of breakdown of a capitalist system were allegedly founded upon Marx and Engels' historical materialism, that's in quotations, as a law of history. According to this orthodox view, two concepts, the productive forces and the relations of productions are directly connected to each other, forming together the mode of production together. With regard to historical materialism, Marx is famously stated in a contribution to the critique of political economy in the 1850s in the following manner, quote, a certain stage of development, the, the material productive forces of society came into conflict with the existing relations of production are, and this is merely and expresses the same thing in legal terms with the property relations within the framework of which they have operated hitherto. From the form and development of the productive forces, these relations turn into feathers. Then begins an era of social revolution. The changes in the economic foundation lead sooner or later to the transformation of the whole immense superstructure. Uh, asterisk. This quote is one of the three quotes that clarifies what historical materialism is and Marx and Engels, that's not a term that they used a lot. Uh, it's also uh, one of the base superstructure metaphor pieces that everyone makes a big deal out of. Uh, so much comes out of this quote. Anyway, this patch has provided a framework of historical materialism. In principle, the driving force of history was located in the productive forces. Maximizing them would lead to the replacement of the existing mode of production with a new one. This view is the main cause of notorious productivist vision, the so-called Prometheanism, in the tradition of Marxism. According to this view, socialism was supposed to realize the full potentialities of productive forces. Such a view has been repeatedly criticized as an unecological economic determinism. Asterisk, this is Warren talking. This is Seho's, uh, Seto's whole career. Um, and trying to refute and Marx and the Anthropocene and uh, Karl Marx's equal socialism. He really has devoted a whole lot of his career to saying this is not true. It's also part of Paul Burkett uh, and um, John Bellamy Foster making a lot of these passages and also passages in the critique of the Goethe program about the, the separation of uh, the, um, the values are not produced, but are not all produced by labor. Uh, for example, um, which certain Marxists have taken up to defending in ways that really make a hash of the text, although I'll get back to that when I continue my uh, discussion of the critique of the growth program. 
dilemma of orthodox Marxism is that if one is to emphasize the electricity of capital, the scheme of historical materialism does not work anymore. Alternatively, yeah, this is why there's some Marxists who insist on rejecting the regulation school separations of like classical uh, capitalism, Fordist capitalism, um, neoliberal capitalism, etc. Alternatively, historical materialism tends to underestimate the elasticity of capital by end, by emphasizing the iron law of history falling into Prometheanism. There's a whole lot of assertions there, Sato, that you put in one paragraph. I don't even necessarily disagree with you, but that ain't an argument. Back to the text. Certainly, it is not necessary to ascribe Prometheanism to Ingalls. See Camilla Royal's contribution in this volume, which we will check out later, maybe. Can't do the whole book, but we can do different essays. In the dialectics of nature, especially in the same section where Engels discusses the relationship between humans and apes, he famously wrote, let us not, however, flatter ourselves over much by the account of human conquest over nature. For each such conquest takes revenge on us. Each of them, it is true, has its first place in the consequence on which we counted. But in the second and third places, it is quite different. Unforeseen effects, which are off, too far off and cancel, are out the first. Uh, Indicate... Ellipses indicating removed text. Thus, at every step, we are reminded that we are by no means rule over nature like a conqueror over a foreign people, like someone standing outside of nature, but that we, with flesh, blood, and brain, belong to nature and exist in its midst, and that when all our mastery of it consists in the fact that we have the advantage over other beings being able to know and correctly apply its laws. Engels, Dialectics of Nature, and the MECW, volume 25. It is wrong to simply attribute Prometheanism to Engels. He was clearly aware of the destructive cap character of capitalist development against nature. Yeah, duh. Nevertheless, there are persistent critiques against Engels' ecology. For example, and Jason W. Moore argues in Capitalism and the Way of Life, that it is too static to think that if a law of nature continues to be ignored, nature will take revenge on humans one day. Um, see, Jason W. Moore, Capitalism, Web of Life, Ecology, and the Accumulation of Capital, uh, 2015. And we've had Jason on the show. All right. Neil Smith rejects this kind of warning from ecological Marxism as left apocalypticism. See, Neil Smith, Uneven Development, uh, University of Georgia Press, 2008. As seen above, this kind of criticism arises because Engels did not fully integrate Marxist discussion of, of, of elasticity into his own ecological theory. See Sato, Marx, and Engels. Uh, this, however, this kind of critique does not apply to Marx. See Sato, Marx, in the Anthropocene value metabolic riff and the non Cartesian dualism. Without the theory of elasticity, Engels' discussion of nature's revenge looks like an apocalyptic warning, as Smith advocates. Furthermore, since Engels does not highlight the concept of elasticity of capital, he contributed to the emergence of breakdown theory. Dude, so did Marx contribute to the emergency of breakdown theory. Come on, Sato, you know that. It was assumed in the, in the critique of political economy in 1850 that you quoted. If Marx abandoned it later, which I also think he may have done, um, or at least complicated it sufficiently enough that with elasticity that it cannot be merely assumed axiomatically, it's very funny that almost no one noticed that, including Lukash, for, I don't know, uh, 100 years? Um, not quite 100 years, more like 60 but that that shift comes when the prediction didn't happen and then a new theory of monopoly capital happened which by the way sato uh i would like you to talk about why that doesn't still hold because neoliberalism doesn't operate by the laws that sweezy outlined in the 60s and 70s i'm looking at you kid sato's younger than me by the way which makes me angry Anyway, back to the text. This, furthermore, another discussion of Marx's critique of political economy that Engels did not fully integrate into his own theory. 
which led to the strengthening of the orthodox schema of historical materialism. I will say that this is what I'm talking. I will say that historical materialism uh, comes out of not even a whole lot. I mean, it comes out of anti-during. It comes out of the, the critique of political economy and it comes out of later thinkers. Um, back to the text. And this aspect is much more important as it is directly related to the concept of productive forces in the historical materialism. The key concept here is Marx's notion of the productive forces of capital. Marx wrote about concepts, for example, quote, to extend the worker, the extent that the worker, excuse me, I can't read tonight, the extent that the worker creates wealth, living, labor becomes the power of capital. Similarly, all development of productive forces of labor is development of productive forces of capital. Karl Marx, Economic Manuscripts of 1861 to 1863 in the MECW, Volume 30. This claim is located in the section where Marx explicated the real assumption of labor under capital. Uh, Asterisk for talk. Everybody loves this section. There's so much of the section comes out of this, and some of it is not even published in that section of um, the Economic Manuscripts. The point of Marx's argument is that the development of productive forces in the capitalism does not proceed in such a way that ultimately emancipates humans from labor, but rather dismantles the knowledge and insight of workers in the labor process, the so-called separation of conception and execution. See Harry Braverman, Labor and Monopoly Capital, the degradation of, of work in the 20th century, a.k.a. You're really seeing Sado's biases in who he's citing, Braverman, the Monopoly Capital people. People need to know that when they read Sado. You need to know the hermeneutic tradition which a writer is operating with, uh, with when they're reading Marx, right? Because they're often interpreting according to those schema. You, and if you don't know those schema, you can't call it out. This is just an important hermeneutic to learn, all right? been using hermeneutic a lot lately because it's something I really want to emphasize for you. Different Marx has come to different conclusions because of the way they prioritize different texts. And they often do not state their priorities or their conceptual apparatuses explicitly. You have to figure it out from their footnotes and their references. I don't know. You thought this was already hard. It gets a lot harder. All right. It completes the domination of capital over workers. Hart and Aguirre, uh, for example, take this in a different direction, but they also talk about real subsumption, as do the End Notes Collective, as do a lot of other people. And they all have different interpretations of what real subsumption means. Back to the text. Put another way, workers whose skills and knowledges are deprived by capital lose not only objective working conditions of production, but even the subjective ability to realize their own labor without subjugated to, without subjugated to the domination of let me reread that sentence again because it's not great but even the subjective ability to realize their own labor without subjugated to the domination of capital that's what it says this is because workers can now realize their own labor by working under the commando and supervision of capital the commando and supervision of capital i think that means command but the text says commando i'm leaving it in there therefore when productive forces increase through competition in the market, they appear in the perverse form of increase in the productive forces of capital, even though it's actually an increase in the productive in the social productive forces of the workers themselves. I'm going to read that again. Therefore, when the social productive forces increase through competition in the market, they appear in the perverse form of the increase of the productive forces of capital, even though it's actually increasing the social productive forces of the workers themselves, i.e. you work harder, but it looks like capitalism is just becoming more efficient. Marx also said, brought quote, the social conditions of labor emerge from the social productive power of labor and are posited by labor itself appear the most emphatically as forces not alien, not only alien to the worker, belonging to capital, but also directed in the interest of the capitalists in a hostile and overwhelming fashion against that of the industrial worker. Karl Marx, The Economic Manuscripts of 1861-1863, in the Marx-Engels Collective Works, volume 34. As a consequence, 
As a consequence, workers become sub subjectless and confront the objective meanings of productions without autonomy to realize their own labor power, aka they're alienated from their labor. That's why I'm talking. On the contrary, the objective conditions appear as, quote, an alien power, an independent power to them. Insofar that capital employs labor, the relations of subject and object is inverted in the labor process. Economic Manuscripts of 1861 and 1863, Volume 30. Marx also calls the inversion of the subject and object, quote, a personification of the thing and the reification of the person. Marx's Economic Manuscripts, 1861 and 1863, and the MCW, Volume 34, again. Since labor is embodied in capital, the role of the worker is reduced to that of a mere bearer of a reified thing, i.e. that is a means of valorizing capital next to the machines, and the reified thing attains the appearance of subjectivity that controls an alien power, the behavior and will of the person. As a reified power of capital now penetrates to the labor process, it is inevitable that the increase of social productive forces emerges only through capital's initiative. Thus, when one takes Marx's discussion on, quote, the productive forces of capital, unquote, it is no longer possible to that Marx held the basic scheme of, quote, historical materialism, unquote. That's a leap. Say it, I want to see if you justify it. It is not at all clear how the development of pro uh, proactive forces automatically opens up the possibility to establish new modes of production. Proactive forces or productive forces? Just in this section, this translation seems to have gotten sloppy. Anyway, back to the text. Compared to Marx's treatment of, quote, productive forces of the capital, there remains ambivalence in Engels' discussion. It seems the latter generations did not simply misunderstand what Engels formulated as a law of history. In other words, Engels fundamentally remained unchanged with regard to the traditional scheme of historical materialism, while Marx distanced himself from the productivist scheme as he became more ecological in the 1860s. See, Cato's with Karl Marx is Equal Socialism. I'm not convinced by that book. I, I, I've read it now twice, and I think it is a masterful work of scholarship. However, Sato makes a big deal out of notes that Marx does not fully incorporate into any published volume of Capital, and makes a big deal out of Marx seeming to agree with Liebig and er, other thinkers while he still insists on he been on Marx being right without changing his initial position, which seemed to agree with Ricardo. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, that's because it's a very obscure Marx logical debate on which Sato actually makes the argument that it changes the entire meaning of Capitals Volume 1 through 3 because of one discussion on a footnote about soil depletion. Yeah. I'm not convinced. Um, I'm going to have to read Sato's Karl Marx and the Anthropocene to see if I can about that either. But while I think Sato is a good and knowledgeable scholar, he has hermeneutics that he's not, that he just accepts and doesn't argue for as seen in this text here. All right. <sighs> it is not clear how the developments of proactive forces lead to new automatically opens up possibility to establish a new mode of production. I would say see uh, uh, Alvin Gilmer's two Marxisms for why this seems to be ignoring counterindications in the reading. Gildner says they're both readings are perfectly consistent with the text, and that's something that drives Marxists up the wall. Anyway, compared to Marx's treatment of productive force of the capital, there remains ambivalence in Engels' discussion. It seems that later generations not simply understands what Engels formulated. I've already talked about that. All right, back to the next one. For example, in 1882, the late Engels wrote in Socialism and Utopian and Scientific in a way that resembles the earlier version of a historical materialism. Quote, but the bourgeoisie, as, sh as also shown there, cannot transform the puny means of production into mighty productive forces without transforming them at the same time from the means of production of the individual into the social means of production only workable by a collectivity of men. Uh, ellipses indicating text removed. Thus, the products now produced socially were not appropriated by those who actually set in motion the means of production and actually produced the commodities, but by the capitalists. The means of production and production itself have become, in essence, socialized, but they were subjugated to, subjected to a new form of appropriation, which presupposes the private production of individuals, under which, therefore, everyone owns his own product and brings it to the market. The mode of production is subjected to the form of appropriation, although it abolishes the conditions on which the labor rests. The contradiction, which gives the new mode of production capital's character, contains the germ of the whole 
of the social antagonism of today. The greater the mastery obtained by the new modes of production over all important fields of production and in manufacturing countries, the more it reduced the individual production to an insignificant residuum, the more clearly brought out the incompatibility of socialized production with capitalist appropriation. Engels, Socialism, Utopian and Scientific, and the Marx Engels Collective Works, Volume 24. According to this scheme, the development of productive forces prompts the transformation of the entire means of production to socialized means of production. Mark, uh, Engels actually indicates this happens to the joint stock program. In this way, a means of production and the products become increasingly socialized. The reason why Engels makes a point to the joint stockholding program is it moves private ownership to partially socialized ownership through diffusion of ownership shares. I'm not seeing this discussed in Sado. In this way, the means of production and products become increasingly socialized so that they cause conflicts with the system of private property and private production under capitalism or production. Social production turns into reality, turns out incompatible with the private appropriation of the capitalism. As already pointed out, this kind of vision goes back to Marx and Engels in the 1840s. As the orthodox Marxists treated the German ideology in the Communist Manifesto as a grounding text of historical materialism, Marx and Engels founded such a view out of historical development at the time. However, the difference between Marx and Engels is that Engels' theoretical framework basically remained unchanged, while Marx has significantly modified his vision in the later critique of political economy in the 1860s. According to the scheme of the orthodox Marxism, the economic crisis would cause proletarian revolution, as in the moment of crisis, the capital system is stripped of its fictitious appearances, and the underlying socialized production and property would be appropriated by the working class, I, aka the immiseration thesis uh, or the breakdown theory, which aren't quite the same thing, but they're related. As a result, Engels' theory of crisis turned out to be quite compatible with the inevitability of collapse of the capitalist mode of production. In short, in Engels' framework, quote, the apocalyptic collapse is twofold. On one hand, civilization collapses due to the revenge of nature. On the other hand, capitalist mode of production collapses due to the increasing tension between the, the increasing productive forces and the capitalist relations of production. Two aspects of crisis are only compatible by presupposing the socialist mode of production can soon overcome the ecological crisis through the emancipation of productive forces under a new regime. Simply by replacing private property with communal property under socialism, it would be possible to overcome the destructive character of productive forces under capitalism. After all, this turns out to be close to a Promethean vision, which however undermines the importance of Engels' discussion on nature's revenge. What Marx emphasized in contrast can be summarized in two points, productive forces of capital and the elasticity of capitalism. capital. The two concepts actually allowed Marx to reject the scheme of historical materialism and breakdown theory. Marx doesn't ever explicitly say that, though. Sato, you just keep on implying that Marx disagrees with it. And, and I see their reasons for the implications aren't bad. It does seem to be Marx was playing with ideas way beyond that in his text. But we have to figure out, do we value unpublished texts higher than published ones in our interpretation of what Marx was willing to sign off on? That's a hermeneutic question, and you haven't answered it, Sato. I'm looking at you. All right, back to the text. Furthermore, this approach could have been compatible with Lukács' theory of crisis, which is founded on his critique of modern science and technology. This is actually a direction that Esteban Marzaros, a younger colleague of Lukács, took up in his theory of metabolism. See Kohei Seito's Marxist theory of metabolism, the age of ecological crisis, historical materialism, issue 20, uh, uh, volume 28, issue number two, 2020. The late Lukács, however, did not develop his earlier theory of crisis anymore. This is an unfortunate fact. When Lukács started to focus on the theory of metabolism and Taylorism and dialectic, there was still a way for a more nuanced treatment of the social ontology of being without falling into the Cartesian dualism between society and nature. However, Lukács in the, in the 1960s developed his theory of social ontology together with a more positive treatment of Engels' theory of labor. And as such, there's nothing wrong with it, but Lukács came to de-emphasize the difference between Marx and Engels in general. As a result, 
Marx's discussion of productive forces of capital and the elasticity of capital remain under noticed, unnoticed to the late Lukash, so that he also eliminated his theory of crisis in the face of the stem and persistence of capitalism. Asterix Barn talking. The problem is that the ecological crisis, which is implied by both Engels and Marx, is not a huge part of their theory of crisis, which is a theory of overproduction. Not the overproduction and exhaustion of resources, but the overproduction and the inability of them to be forced upon the market. Now, I think this is still worth reading, and I think it's a very interesting argument. But you can see, as I'm trying to point out with you as we do these interpretations, you have to read these things close because they have, they're making even good scholars like like Sato have reading apparatuses that they're not stating for you or they assume you know about them. And if you disagree with them ideologically, which, you know, you have to accept Sweezy and Braverman as factual, um, and you have to accept a hermeneutic that values unpublished notes versus published material to posit that Marx and Engels are separate like that, to that distinctive a degree. Sato's more fair to Ingalls than certain new leftists were. Um, but instead of positing that both both a tendency and a counter tendency are in Marx himself, that he never works out, and this Ingalls like uh, has a more strong form of the same ambivalence, Sato like has Marx saying one thing, uh, which is partially in Marx, but repudiating things which Marx doesn't formally and explicitly repudiate. That's a problem. When you read secondary sources like this, and the reason why I went through the whole thing with you, is so you would pay attention to the assumptions the secondary sources are bringing to the material. Do not just assume they are correct. Do not assume that just because you disagree with a framework or a hermeneutic or a critical apparatus, that also the scholar is not valid or not useful. Sometimes there's useful information in one of these things, even if you do not accept the critical information. I think there's tons of interesting stuff in Sato. I think he's a good um, cataloger and reader of Marx, but I do think he comes from a particular hermeneutic and theoretical apparatus tradition that isn't always stated. And with that, we're going to end the show today. <laughs>